Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar, The Rise of Reuse, New Thinking on Adaptation and Renovation. If at any point you have any difficulties viewing this webinar, please click on the chat bot bottom right of your screen and one of our technical support team will help you via live chat. There's plenty of opportunity for Q&A along the way too, so to submit a question, simply click on the button on screen. So let's get started with Shuko UK's Commercial Director, Sean Butler. Welcome to the latest in our series of AT Shuko webinars. In today's webinar, we will be looking at the development of new architectural approaches for the adaptation and renovation of existing buildings to make them fit to be reused. We have three expert speakers who will give a short presentation to explain the context of their approach to buildings reuse and help us to set the scene for today's discussions. This is a topic that fits squarely into our ethos at Shuko, where sustainable action is an important part of our corporate policy and strategic focus. We know that buildings cause a staggering 40% of CO2 emissions in Europe, and we believe it's critical that the energy efficiency of buildings must be massively improved. We are committed at Shuko to providing outstanding refurbishment products and solutions for sustainable buildings as part of any renovation and repair of existing buildings. I think today's discussion will raise many other crucial and highly relevant issues for all those interested in, in the potential offered by upgrading and re reusing existing building stock. Thank you once again for joining us. I'll now pass you over to Chris, who's chairing today's event. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, I'm Chris Vages, architect editor of Architecture Today, and uh, welcome again to uh, this uh, online seminar on the rise of reuse, uh, which uh, Architecture Today is organising in partnership with Shuko. Um, the subject uh, we've chosen arises because we're at a moment where renovation and adaptation of existing buildings is not only high up the agenda because of sustainability concerns, uh, but uh, also because it appears to be uh, an area from which a lot of the most influential and discussed and critically admired architecture is coming. Um, and you know, perhaps you know, we can think back to projects like um, Tate Modern or the Neues Museum by David Chipfield Architects uh, as, as examples of that. Uh, and that's perhaps something that's happened over the last 10 years in a way that wouldn't have been true uh, uh, for, in earlier periods in quite the same way. Um, so to discuss uh, where we see reuse of existing buildings within architecture and within their own practice, we have uh, uh, very pleased to have a, a, an expert panel uh, of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Rob Leachmere of Jonathan Tucky Design. We have Sarah Castle of IFDU and we have Stephen Bates of Surges and Bates. Um, and the format is that each of them will talk for a bit about um, where reuse figures in their own work and uh, in their own thinking within their practices. Um, uh, and after, uh, there will be an opportunity to op for them to answer questions after each uh, little segment, uh, and also again at the end where we reconvene for a panel discussion. So please do, uh, as, as we go along throughout, submit any questions that you have or any observations, thoughts into the, uh, the questions box below your video player. Uh, but now, to get us started, i uh, hand over to Rob. Jonathan Tucky Design was set up in the year 2000 by Jonathan Tucky, and we are currently a 16-person team based in London. We specialise in transforming and rethinking existing buildings. So this presentation, we will show a small selection of themes we like to explore in our work and how we believe these can influence architecture uh, beyond the realm of reuse. The themes we'd like to look at today are richness through dialogue, context and condition as direction, embracing imperfection and unfinishedness. First theme is richness through dialogue. It's the overlaying of competing or harmonious ideas to create a more layered, nuanced approach within a project. The project I think that kind of demonstrates these ideas well is it's called Upper Wimpole Street and it's a grade two listed house in Marlebone which we were converting a two bedroom apartment on the ground floor. Here you can see the view from the street. So how we could change the experience of the plan without moving an excessive amount of structure uh, because it was listed is quite an important idea I'd like to explore. How could we establish a relationship between this facade 
and the plan? And could we use the proportion and formality, shape and pattern of the Georgian facade? The idea of creating a building inside a building and a new architecture contained within an old architecture, we are curious to see what relationships would be created from doing that. In looking at the idea of internal architectures, the obvious reference was Antonello Damasina's St. Germany's study, which led on to other Renaissance, early Renaissance depictions of, I think you could call them Balvachin, uh, small, highly ornate structures, mainly found in churches above a, a, uh, a chair for the bishop or pope. And these are fragments of the Borgo San Sepulcro altar, altarpiece by Stefano Di Giuliani. And I think they depict the life of St. Francis. But we're more interested in these arches, columns, and how they seem to exist within a larger building. And here you can see how those ideas have, you know, pollinated become what you, yeah, the, the idea of something new inside a larger building and not touching the existing walls so much, you know, or not moving them. And it's important to note this wasn't a stylistic exercise. It was about creating spaces inside larger spaces and having a connection to the style of the building, but also having something very new and obviously you know, of our time. Here you can see again how we've inserted this piece of joinery as a piece of architecture and how the curves help flow through the space and create these views through. through. So here you can see how that works. It's a very long, deep plan. So yeah, emphasizing that, creating these like long perspectives was quite important to us. Um, in terms of practice in the modern context, even outside the realm of reuse, the idea of structures laid inside structures, an almost epidermal approach, I think is quite an important one to take away from this project. So the second theme is context and condition as direction. How a building's location in a greater socio-geographic landscape may inform its use and or design. Should what is found on the site affect what is later built on the site? So this project is called Vactus, and it's a former Swiss army observation post high up above the village of Andermatt in Switzerland. So this drawing was made to help us contextualize what is a small building, a cyclopean landscape, and also its regional context. And you can see that Teufelsbrücke at the bottom of the valley is the Devil's Bridge, one, once painted by Turner. And it's one of the main links from Northern Europe into northern Italy, back back in uh, history. And also this area, the Gotthard Massif, is a point from which four major European rivers rise, namely the Rhine, Rhone, Rus, and Ticino, physically linking the site to the wider continent. So I think the main ideas drawn from this project are how much of the existing inform the new, how much should be reused, and also to have fun. So you can see here the colours and the wood panelling and a lot of the kind of sense of the place, the red is kind of kept as a, as a, as a, a, a then you, you call it a motif. And at the same time, we've tried to uncover some new existing original wood structure beneath. Here you can see a strong connection to the mountain with some of the local stone used there. And again, it's, it's very much tied to the original building, but it's very much new. It's got a different use. And the idea of having fun, I think, you know, comes from using iconography of the canton. So these special shapes and colours denote this area particularly. And then also kind of a bit of military type um, font there to show where the nearest peaks are. So investigation, the accumulation of knowledge during a project is an outcome in itself, even if it's not visible in the final projects. I think contextually, the project gave a unique location an opportunity to investigate and critique a range of ideas. These were not just around the sustainability in architecture and the reuse of existing buildings, but a large discussion about topics such as environmental decay, water security and migration. 
the third project, I think, in the third theme is is embracing imperfection. And it's the broken and irregular should be welcomed as special. Designing to incorporate a building's history is a more enjoyable and rewarding process. So the project that links to that is it's called Cornish Cottage, and it's a 400-year-old Dartmoor longhouse located not too far away from Tintagel Castle. So when we talk about imperfection, landscapes are inherently imperfect. And by that, I mean they're in constant flux and transit. And this is particularly true in coastal areas such as where this project is. And we see the sea is very much a temporal device. And we made these drawings to speak to each other and create an understanding of the house as part of the landscape changing over long spans of time, imperfect, but embracing those aspects. I think the challenge is how to incorporate and celebrate these ideas. And an idea we moved towards was the new and the mame would be linear or cut around the old, more geological forms of the house. So here you can see the kind of errant walls, quite sail-like, not very straight, but then these interventions had to fit in and embracing that unperfect fit and making it a, a feature of the house and here you can see some very skilled carpenters we had on the project scribing ceiling panels which you know counterpoint to the old 400 year old walls these new perfect panels so it's almost the natural and the man-made here again you know skilled craftsmen needed to deal with these not straight walls, these imperfect walls, and also the idea that things are okay to be broken, particularly that you can see in this beam here. Um, I think the main project's outcomes are, it's, yeah, it's okay for things to be broken, and time is an important architect in all buildings, and it's one to be studied. So the fourth final theme is unfinishedness. There's a quote here from Michael Graves, which I think is quite suitable. It's, an existing building can be thought of as an unfinished fragment of a larger edifice. And the question you would like to ask from this project is, should architects design the knowledge that a future architect may work on their building? Um, so the project was, it's a former industrial building dating from 1903, located on the Warschauer Strasse in East Berlin. It's now a hotel and we were to transform it and make a series of rooms. Um, some drawings we produced showing how the new rooms would be fit into the fourth floor in this case, and an individual room showing our kind of intervention there. The idea of unfinishedness is quite useful to talk about in the context of this project. It's partly due to the idea of a building that has many lives and incarnations, such as this one, an industrial building, now a hotel. It's partly about the idea that a building is not finished when it is built, but continues to react and have relationships way beyond that. So in the, in the context of this project, we're not talking about the unfinishedness of the hotel, but that of the S-Barn signal box here. The motif and layering of Palestine can be, see here, can be seen here to reverberate through the street setting into the hotel. So you've got these vertical palisades, divisions, coming across to the hotel where it can see again in the facade and then into the rooms and beyond. So, and then even into the actual joinery we produced for the project, the bed here. And this, this idea posed the questions about where does the signal box actually finish? Where does the hotel actually finish? And generally, where does a building finish? And I think that's quite an important idea to take forward designing architecture. Here you can see some of the other parts of the rooms we designed and again this palisading theme echoed throughout and creating these optical illusions using mirrors. Um, I like the idea that architecture is never complete and borrowing just tones and um, textures from what was there before even if it was a building site it might seem it's quite an interesting idea as well and as architects, I'm sure part of our egos like the idea that our final built design is perfect and should not be altered. Um, but should we make more of a considered effort to accept 
even include the idea that our buildings will be changed and reused. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob, for that uh, really interesting insight into the work or the thinking of um, Jonathan Tucky Design. I was struck by um, uh, the fact that you talk about things like unfinishedness, imperfection, uh, and changeability as uh, as the kind of qualities uh, that you're seeking to draw out and celebrate and and work with, which of course, yeah, in, in some in some ways might be perceived to be um, opposite to the normal qualities that people are aiming for in architecture. Do you do you find that you have to sort of try and unlearn um, or consciously unlearn some of the things that um, architecture is supposed to be in, in, in to do the sort of work that you're doing? Um. I, I, I think it, um, it comes from the idea of um, understanding that things are in constantly in flux, like the idea of the city being not a kind of stasis body, it's kind of always changing in the same way buildings. Um, in terms of unlearning, um, I think it's replacing rather than uh, unlearning, you know, just changing the way you think about things. Yeah. I mean, I, thinking about practice in general, the, it very clearly, was established to and, and continues to have uh, um, a primary interest in reusing buildings, and it has a, quite unusually on the website a, a section called ethos, which which says you know, we 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 are here to um, to work with existing buildings. But it but now certainly it's not it's not limited to that. There are one or two new build projects um, on the books. So I wonder what how. Um, whether you whether you feel that because uh, there are certain practices, for instance, Lacton and Versailles in France, which have um, is that developed some quite uh, specific rules about their their approach to building. So, for instance, in never demolish in their case. Whether you feel that you need to be so kind of rigid about your uh, approach to new versus existing building, or whether it's just something you can, um, as it were, kind of uh, uh, tailor tailor according to circumstance. Yeah, I think it is um, our, our kind of the way we design is based on judgment of a particular building. Of course, we try not to demolish anything, you know, in the same way as Lacton lack for sale, but um, we do make judgments based on what the client wants as well. I mean, they are a, a big factor in any project. Um, and also, you know, it, it is sometimes more expensive to uh, keep things in place. And yeah. I think that you know the the uh, the economics of keeping everything built is a, a big factor in projects. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a project like Upper Wimpole Street that you showed just there yeah. is very beautiful, um, uh, where you've made kind of interior linings or, or you know what you know. I, I think possibly you even described it as as you know a sort of large scale furniture piece within uh, within an interior or a kind of a, an inner skin within an outer skin. But is it? Do you think that sometimes reuse, where it's perceived to be um interior has sort of suffered reputationally next to the more heroic business of moving around large amounts of structure and volumes of material that somehow that's kind of um uh that that's that's um that's got kind of uh, the kudos that uh, that reuse of existing buildings has has not been afforded historically um i think one part of me as an architect yeah would like to do very monumental big mm -hmm. large scale <laughs> buildings but um and there is a kind of ego thing with that i suppose yeah i you know very much so but i think if you know small scale interventions on the on the scale of a joinery project like that i mean have their own merit they're just very different animals aren't they it's uh, um yeah well we have uh, we have several more questions coming in on on the content of your talk but that might be something that we say for the discussion afterwards because i think now we we um we move on to uh, to hear from sarah so thanks very much Rob. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Chris. So we're in a climate emergency. In the UK, the built environment as a whole is responsible for 42% of national emissions. The manner in which we create and maintain our built environment continues to cause huge damage to biodiversity and ecosystems. And it also encourages unsustainable lifestyles. At the same time, it's estimated that around 85% of the buildings that exist today will still be around in 2050. So it's extremely important for us to take retrofitting seriously. 
I'm going to talk to you about a retrofit project that we're working on at the moment. The project is a community-led development of the Observer Building in Hastings. Um, retrofitting existing buildings can help us to reduce energy consumption, help reduce carbon emissions and limit our impact on climate change, and can provide these huge environmental benefits immediately. But for us also, retrofitting existing buildings can be used as a tool for creating positive social impact in communities, encouraging new healthier lifestyles, breathing life into buildings which may be derelict and causing stagnation of the local area, and also becoming positive catalysts for change in neighbourhoods and communities. I'm going to start with this photograph by John Cole, um, a local photographer in Hastings. It's of a street artist working at the shutters of the building last year, and it describes well one of the main ideas for the project. At the heart of the Observer Building project and the Hastings Commons more widely is the idea of retrofitting as a process of active inclusion, or what our clients call darning the fabric. I'm going to just quote our client here. Um, we want to see local people able to shape the future of the place, physically, culturally, socially, and economically, especially those who are rarely heard. This is more, about, this is more than about having a say, it's about actually making it happen. The metaphor of darning the fabric refers to the physical renovation of buildings and spaces. It implies that this is something that ordinary people can do and captures our concern for the existing fabric, both physical and social. So this is the Observer Building at the point of construction in the top left. It was built in 1924 as the hub of the F.J. Parsons newspaper empire. And at that time, it employed 500 people. So it really was a civic hub when it was uh, first opened. And this is it now. It closed in 1985. It's empty and it's been increasingly derelict over 34 years. Over that period, it's had 13 owners, all of whom made money out of it without doing any work to the building. 17 planning applications have occurred there. And this is its location in Hastings. So you can see from the map, it's right next to the town centre, it's close to the Hastings Pier and the train station, so it's right on the coast. So this is a kind of story of some really strong community interest that's been demonstrated over many, many years. And it goes back to 2006 when the community mobilised to uh, take action as the Hastings Pier was closed. And since then, our clients have been really heavily involved in that community engagement. Um, and since then, basically trying to bring together as wide a group of locals as possible to create a shared idea or a shared vision for that part of Hastings. So this is the area again, and you can see that that white kind of outline at the centre, that's, that's the Observer Building. Um, and it sits within this really challenging context. Um, a lot of the buildings around it became derelict in the mid-1980s and caused a really long-term drag on that entire neighbourhood. So our client's ambition is to bring this previously derelict space into a productive use that can benefit the local community and help grow the local economy for common good. So there we are. Um, we call this area the Hastings Commons and, and that actually, that's our client alongside a group of other local organisations. They describe themselves as a, a civic ecosystem of organisations with shared values. And you can see from this map some of the buildings and spaces that they've taken custodian ownership of. So that's the Observer Building as well as a number of um, other kind of caves, spaces, cottages, um, etc. So through this Hastings Commons, they try to um, protect diversity, well-being and stability through capped rents. They promote social sol solidarity and cooperation. They nurture community agency and they do, um, as I referred to before, this physical darning of the neighbourhood. Um, so this is a pretty amazing photograph taken by drone of the front of the building. Um, and it kind of shows you the state of the building when uh, White Rock Neighbourhood Ventures, our client, bought it in, on Valentine's Day last year. Um, since then, they've been carrying out concrete repairs. So again, this is the first time that any repairs have been carried out on the building. And it was the first thing they did to get it into a stable um, condition. And since then, there's been a series of workshops and temporary uses as we've been designing um, the, and developing that design of the building with them. 
again a drone photograph this at this time of the west side of the building you can see it's a really huge um, huge building it's 4,000 meters squared it's seven stories what you don't get from this photograph is the fact that whilst it's on a slope on this side it's actually buried into the ground another um, two stories below this and situated over a series of, uh, of caves um, so you can see from this the survey that the building is in quite a state at the moment even more so on the east facade we can see here that this is like a building that needs a lot of TLC. At the left hand side of this image you can see a, a 1950s extension that was added, full height of the building. At the bottom you can just make out some of the rock face that the caves are, are carved into and you might be able to make out some of those openings at the bottom as well. I think these photographs from the alley side, so again this is the um, east side of the building, you, you can really see those rock faces and the condition of the building as it stands at the moment. And on the inside it's not much better now and um, this was actually taken prior to the concrete repairs but um, this is the condition that the building was in when our client took it over. And so whilst it looks beautiful, um, street art, the, the kind of art in the building really gives it a, an amazing character. You can see from this photograph the water on the floor. And the fact is, is that we need to carry out a significant amount of repair work just to get it watertight at the roof level this Christmas to stop the water damaging the concrete repairs that have already occurred. You can see this at the very top floor of the building. It's a 1950s extension. Um, and there's actually a temporary restructure within that extension to try and help us solve the issue of this extra water that's just coming through the failed roof. So this is a really early sketch um, that we did of the building, which gives you a little idea of the complexity. And again, you can see those caves at the bottom of the building just carved out into the rock face. Um, the Observer Building Project is one that looks to create a thriving community within the building and that's a combination of leisure, workspaces, residential spaces and community spaces. So it's, a, it's the possibility of becoming a positive catalyst for the neighbourhood and a, and a beacon of community-led regeneration. So the intention is to create this ecosystem of buildings and spaces for a diverse range of people and organisations. Um, it should be a space for, for a community with shared principles and really encourage positive working relationships. And what's really amazing about some of the work that's gone on since the building was bought is and, and, and actually really exemplify some of the benefits of retrofit beyond, for instance, just repair work is the way that the community or the building can be used whilst the design is being developed. So here, um, this is demonstrative of some of the workshops that have been run for the local community. So this is particularly targeted at excluded people or people out of work. So this is um, a workshop around uh, creating stud partitions and teaching um, local community members how to do some really practical joinery skills. So it's an opportunity to learn um, and develop together. The benefit of retrofit can also be um, in terms of using the building whilst the design's developing um, in the way that we can bring the public into it. So that's a series of like really loads of tours that we've done and that's not just for local councillors, that's for lots of local people so they can come and see what's going on inside the building. Um, here, these are actually photographs from um, one of the many events that have been held there. This one is actually part of the Coastal Currents Art Fair. We've actually used some of these events as being really good ways of engaging with the community and showing them the development of the design as it progresses and also getting their feedback. Um, we've held a series of art exhibitions within the building um, and this one's particularly important as you might be able to see from the photographs, four artists have been commissioned to um, document the process of this um, renovation from the moment at which our client bought the building. So it's really exciting because it really gives us a chance to kind of show off the work of local creatives as well as providing ourselves with an amazing kind of archive of incredible kind of um, imagery of the building as it progresses. And this is where we're at um, at the moment. So this is um, a kind of an important photograph because, uh, well sorry, image that we've created because it starts to give you an idea of, of what, of the solution that we've arrived at. So this is from a 
extensive engagement that's been carried out over the last year, client briefings, workshops, exhibitions, and inhabiting the space with the people who are going to use it. And um, so here you can see from the proposal, and this is taken from the north, from the Cambridge roadside, that we're going to be carrying out significant repairs, like specialist repairs to the faience facade at the front of the building, improvements to the building fabric, so that's to improve the thermal envelope. We're creating universal access to the building at two levels, which means that people um, uh, of all abilities can come in to, through all of the main entrances of the building, which is so important. Um, we are creating a series of sensitive additions to the building. So these are kind of roof extensions that give extra community facilities at the top of the building. And so hopefully it was going to become this really exciting new community hub that really has had a lot of um, uh, community input into it in terms of where we've got to. So to talk a little bit about energy, um, the design objectives for the Observer Building were developed with our building services engineer, Webb Yates, and those are be lean, be clean and be green. So that's about using less energy, supplying energy efficiently and also using renewable energy where possible. So um, just to kind of zoom in on some of those areas, you can see um, here that um, we, well, actually, sorry, to refer back to that point about creating universal access to the building, you can, you can really see that um, at this point. Um, but these kind of, the first uh, thing, which is uh, being lean and, and being clean, this is all about improving the fabric of the building. So these are all kind of windows that are um, in keeping with the existing kind of uh, industrial windows, but um, upgrading them to triple glazed windows, for instance, and insulating the building on the inside so that we have that really amazing new fabric that's doing a lot, a lot better in terms of keeping us efficient. Um, you can see here that we've created, um, in some of the spaces, we're keeping our intervention really um, light. So this is a large community space. Um, and by limiting intervention to just what's required, we obviously um, reduce the amount of building materials we're using, which is, of course, better for the environment. Again, those high energy efficiency windows are doing us a lot of good. Thermal lining of walls. Um, but also um, kind of bringing back in that kind of social side of the development, which is really respecting the character of that existing building. And by, at the same time, um, bringing people in to help us with the kind of um, the decoration of the building. And um, so we'll hopefully be commission, commissioning artists to create um, the kind of murals and decoration of the spaces over the course of the years that it's being developed. So it really becomes something that um, is an inclusive process or continues to be an inclusive process. Um, this is uh, the first floor level, it's a workspace um, sample, so again high energy efficiency windows, thermal lining of walls, uh, natural light wherever possible and also an approach to building materials where we do need to use them that we try and pick the healthiest materials we can. So we're trying to prevent off-gassing and make these environments really clean and healthy for people to live and work in. At the top of the building, we're creating new additions at the roof level um, and we're doing that through a series of lightweight timber structures. Now, that, that's for a number of reasons. One of them being, of course, that timber is carbon sequestering. So it's a really good material for us to be creating additions in. Um, it's also lightweight. So that means that it minimizes the impact on the existing structure of the building. So we're not having to reinforce below. Um, Wherever possible, we're not putting any additional steel or any additional concrete in this building. So we're really trying to keep the materials that we're using as healthy and sustainable as possible. The other good thing about lightweight timber construction is that it can be done a lot off-site, which means that we minimise our impact on neighbours and also the other people in the building, because this is going to be a phased development. So we will likely have tenants in before we get to the point that we can build these extensions at the top of the building. And this gives you an idea just to step down. It's one of the other reef levels of, of what we're doing kind of with the existing fabric. So we're taking off this dilapidated 1950s reef extension, but we're actually going to be maintaining the steels, which you can see in this image. And the steels are great because um, 
firstly, we don't want to be throwing that, that away. What it's doing for us at the moment is, is actually helping to stop the masonry wall, flank wall on the west side of the building fall down. Um, but by the same token, it creates a kind of certain um, memory of the of the previous structure was there um, and it also creates a great way of us kind of defining these garden spaces which will enhance biodiversity at the roof of the building and create a really nice space for the the community to occupy and inhabit So here we are, um, a kind of summary in terms of what we've got to with these environmental proposals. So um, in terms of being lean, um, as a result of the sustainability measures that we've incorporated into this design, uh, we're really doing a great job of increasing um, U values to all um, thermal elements. And as a result of all of this, we end up with a reduced carbon emission of 149 tonnes of CO2 per year. Through the efficient uh, use of heating and delivery, we're also going to be further reducing those CO2 levels. So that's our be clean uh, tip. And be green. So we, as part of this development, will be putting in um, renewable air source heat pumps, uh, photovoltaics, um, and a number of other measures which help us to further reduce um, uh, our CO2 levels. And we end up with a saving of around 27.9% um, or 42-ish or tonnes of CO2 a year. And that's just through using these renewable measures. And our clients are absolutely over the moon because this means that it really as an exemplar building within the area but also it reduces bills <laughs> further down the line so as this building will be owned by the community in perpetuity it's really important that we think about what the cost of this building is you know 10 20 years in the future you can see here just as a, a view from above some of those measures that are just sat, um, perched on the top of our timber extension so at the center of that plan you can see the um uh, the, the gardens um, and uh, to the top right of the image you can see some uh, solar panels and photovoltaics on the reef at reef level and also the air source heat pumps at the other end of the building. So to summarise, um, the development of the Observer Building shows an approach to retrofit that demonstrates how working creatively with existing buildings can influence architecture beyond just the practice of renovation and repair. So yes, this is this renovation is of a derelict building and that's brilliant because that building represents a significant piece of history um, within Hastings. But as a retrofit, it's also um, an exemplar for sustainable development and design. It's going to create genuinely affordable homes and workspaces. It's going to create life-changing opportunities, in fact it already has done, through jobs, through training, through the homes and through the enterprises that will exist there. It's also an active form of commoning, so it really brings people together and it will hopefully um, kind of kickstart the transformation of this area of Hastings. I'm going to leave you on this image, which is um, the kind of uh, south extension just popping up over the buildings at the back as we look from the Hastings Pier. And just um, really um, an important image to us because it just, um, I suppose, uh, provides an idea as to how this building will act as a beacon uh, for the community for years to come. Much, Sarah. Uh, I've taken over because we've uh, lost Chris. His connectivity is lost for the moment, but luckily we have a contingency. Uh, so, Sarah, a, a great presentation and lots of really uh, positive comments coming in. Um, Sarah, first one, is your client a community company? If so, how is the scheme funded and is the project being uh, grant aided in any way? Um I could spend probably the rest of the day answering that question <laughs> for you. Um, our client is White Rock Neighbourhood Ventures and um, they are a community-led developer. Um, it's a, a really kind of complex structure. I touched upon the Hastings Commons, which includes a CIC, um, which is uh, the kind of company that will eventually operate the residential units within the building. Um, the project itself is reliant on a number of different uh, funding routes, um, which include both loans and grants. Um, uh, uh, particularly uh, an important one is through uh, Historic England, which is um, for the Heritage Action Zone. So they've campaigned actually to create a funding pot for that whole area, not just the Observer Building. So really looking to kind of keep... Um, 
to encourage retrofit and looking after the neighbourhood as a whole. So really creating that amazing uplift. But yeah, um, the, the funding is complex. And I think that's part of the reason that we're going to be approaching the construction of this building in a phased manner, because not all the funds will be available in one go. Uh, another one. Thank you. It's a fascinating project. What's the internal insulation you're using and what kind of U values have you achieved? And are there any predicted condensation issues? Uh, again, another very good question. Um, we're working on that with our um, mechanical and sustainability consultants, Web Yates, at the moment. Um, the uh, insulation products yet to be defined. We're working through our tender at the moment. We're going to be going out in October. Um, interstitial condensation is always an issue when you're retrofitting buildings, so it's something we're keeping an eye on. But yeah, watch this space on the specification. Hopefully, we'll we'll convince um, somebody to to work with us um, to create something that's uh, really efficient because the other thing we want to to avoid is creating really really thick wall buildups and losing too much of that space on the inside of the building. How does one find the balance between social and design ambitions including cost in use and green objectives versus financial imperatives? Um, so this is uh, the the quite kind of quality cost triangle, um, and I suppose we're adding in social as well here. Um, I think we're really lucky. Um, we have a really um, amazing client who's really driven and really ambitious. So they. Um, uh, but they also trust in their design team. Uh, so we've actually had a really amazing working relationship with them in terms of pushing really um, to create something that's special. I mean, this, this building is a really interesting one. It's a very, very industrial character except for the front facade, which is this incredible ornate terracotta facade. So it has a kind of combination of styles that one can draw from in terms of creating a really amazing kind of architectural response. Um, but we've also, you know, this is a client who's interested in supporting local artists. I showed you some photographs from some of the, the um, work that we've um well, sorry, that they've commissioned local artists to do. So there's no there's no shying away from wanting to create something that's really special for the community. Um, from a cost perspective, working with a QS from an, from an early point in the project is really helpful to kind of keep control on that. But I think the main thing with retrofit is working out which areas are, where, are the best places to spend the money. So rather than kind of like um, trying to make everything um, to a very high level of specification you actually allow bits of the building to just be read as they are you insulate where you need to and then you spend the money on on the items that make the biggest difference so that's that for instance the interface between the front of the building and the street so really spending money and time designing that entrance ramp because it provides universal access to all entering the building but also it's that first impact moment so it's where you can you can touch it you can feel it and you can see the the kind of quality of what we're trying to achieve and um, so yeah we've just been lucky <laughs> we, we've got a good client has there been much of a use an issue rather around asbestos if so has it been removed or encapsulated and likewise has the bit has it been difficult to upgrade to current fire regulations um, asbestos, uh, we are more or less clear of. Um, it was one of the kind of first things we went through. I think there might still be a tiny bit in one of the rooms at the bottom of the building, but we'll, I think we've more or less got rid of it all now. Um, it's certainly, uh, we'll, we, we've had asbestos surveys carried out. Um, in terms of fire, it's really complicated. Um, it's a multi, it's a mixed use building that we're proposing, but it's we've got only two existing uh, staircases within the space. So we're having to work really closely with a fire engineer, with our approved inspector, and with local fire services to um, to get a solution that means that the building's really safe for the people who'll inhabit it. And it, for anybody who knows the fire regulations, it's obviously it's so important that we get this right particularly with the mixture of residential and commercial uses within those spaces. Uh, and a question from Bob. I think this is one of the most exciting projects I've seen for years. How truly is the community involved in driving this forward? And do you know where it's going and where it's going to end? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, so the community are amazingly involved in this. I mean, to the point at which we've done so many... Uh, well, our client has been working with this community for like, I think, 16 years now. Um, and 
they've been involved in workshops we've even had community workshops on the m and &E side of things so people are showing interest not just in you know what it looks like but also how it functions um we have um a kind of we already have an anchor tenant secured for one of the spaces um and in we were struggling with community engagement and how to kind of approach that around coronavirus and one of the most interesting things that's come out of this project is that the community themselves created a tv station off the back of um not being able to kind of maybe interact in the same way and to try and kind of combat ideas around social isolation so they, they created a station called isolation station hastings which you must check out on this i think it's on facebook live um, and we did some of our community engagement through Facebook Live through that TV station so really they're involved in every single facet of the building and the future is is just going to be continuing like this even our kind of PQQs for our contractors and that contractor selection process is all about how the contractor will engage with the community as well so toolbox talks with local community members using local labor so there's lots of different ways and um, that we're kind of involving the community, but they, they are very much involving themselves. They're a very excited group of people and it's brilliant. Super. Sarah, thank you very much indeed for that. There's time for more Q&A. Click on the button if you want to ask a question and uh, there'll be more Q&A uh, around the next presentation, the third and final presentation, plus a panel discussion. We'll endeavour to get Chris, our chair, back on for the panel discussion where we'll bring together the wider aspects of the debate. But let's hear now from Stephen Bates. So this conversation is about reuse about adaptation and renovation and in the case of our work and in particular a specific project reuse is extended to into an understanding of the future of the museum a public space you know the trajectory that the museum might as a as a type may take within the debate of reuse, reconstruction. And we know that historically museums have always been in flux as they question their role within a cultural, within the cultural uh, value, you could say, of, of their, the city they, they sit in, the society that they represent. And they evolved through important sort of uh, stepping stone projects, you could say, and a, a widening debate to react to many different things, to engage with regeneration, uh, to begin to target an ever broader audience and to reach well beyond their own site boundaries. I just think it's really interesting right now not only within the debate, the increasing sustainability debate of low energy use um, and understanding how, of how the city evolves, but with the current impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, a museum closed to the public demonstrates the fragility of the museum is now exposed. And so against these backdrops of which reuse is fundamental but in a way one of many we have been developing the canal center of Pompidou project in Brussels which is basically transforming what was once the largest car factory in Europe into a public space a cultural space in which uh, incorporates museum of modern art museum of architecture the cultural um, centre, office space, supporting that set of institutions, um, itself sitting adjacent to the Kai Theatre, an important independent theatre space in the city. And I mean, reuse is definitely evolving. I find an important benchmark sort of post in the ground you could say moment is 1964 and the Venice Charter that sought to outline a kind of doctrine 
to work with existing buildings, which had from the end of the 19th century, buildings had become referenced as monuments and protected. And the charter attempted to define how to continue their use, give them ex value, and how one would approach the extended life of these buildings. There was, of course, a, I mean, it's a complex document, and in many ways, many, much of it is relevant and for sure creates the sort of benchmark to work that has happened since the 60s and continues to now. In particular, this notion of identifying the addition of new against old, um, that the, the intervention, the layers that make this building or a building uh, to ensure that they are identifiable, to palpable, under, understood as layer upon layer. And that, that seems like a doctrine that's uh, followed. And I must say that Canal, like a few other projects that have happened, either have been realized in the last 10 years or are being worked on right now, in some cases in our own office, uh, as well as Canal. There is this challenge to the idea of, that idea of the, the Venice Charter's view of reuse, which is to recognize the value of a continued narrative in buildings in which the layers of time are absolutely present, but the value of one layer to another is treated um, without judgment and without the need to overtly express one over another or one against another. Indeed, instead one is, we are interested in a, a sort of a hybrid, a demonstration of the actual complexity of the reuse of an existing building anyway, that yes, it has a temporal dimension and one that is sometimes full of agony as well as full of celebration, uh, all that can be, and, and it seems valid that it can be and should be experienced when one visits and engages with the building, but that there is room for subtlety and complexity within that, that the merging of one layer within or against another layer uh, adds a deeper and richer experience. With Canal, our attitude to reuse was set out to be what we call one of radical optimism, which was to trust in what is there and to touch the building as lightly as possible. This was an international competition with a, a, a sort of star cast of competitors and an, a, a sense that uh, an, this was an icon in, in the making. And our position as a collection of architectural practices, by the way, already going against the norm of a the single star architect, but instead a, an umbrella underneath under the name Atelier Canal, um, breaking that convention of the signature building by a cel cel celebrity architect into a broadening collective, a loose group of not only architects, in fact, but curators, artists, other experts. Um, to, to consider a building or to consider that the icon was actually there already, that the Henri Citroën's car factory uh, realised in the 30s as a kind of crystal factory at one end a showroom, at the other end the, the production room, production workshops was itself already an icon, an icon of the city that was already known, that was deeply embedded in not only the urban fabric, but in the cultural memory of the city itself. And it didn't need another icon over the top of it somehow to uh, suppress what was there. It just needed to be exposed to view. You know, the, the hair 
parted to finally see the face. And therefore the idea of touching lightly was fundamental, not only as a cultural idea, but also a sustainable one, a one a, an environmental one, that to change as little as we needed, as, we, as was needed, to work with a expediency and an economy of means felt also wholly appropriate and topical within the conditions that we find ourselves in this, uh, this uncertain world of major change, um, of climate emergency, of demographic change, a strategy of, for a building that would be open and flexible and adaptable and ready for an uncertain future life would be an appropriate architectural strategy. Indeed, we felt that the imagined use and uses of this project um, were immense and it was not necessary to be so precise at the outset, but instead to imagine the building was more like a stage, a public stage, a stage as we called it, a stage for Brussels, a, a building with an open-ended life and an open-ended future. And indeed, a building that wasn't really ever finished, a building that was just opened. And we were very lucky in this case that the client who, we're very happy, selected us to win the project, uh, uh, had very much aligned ideas of what the building could be. And soon after the competition was won, the building was opened uh, as a, a rundown garage, but in fact, as a event space for what was called Canal Brut, which was a one year long exhibition project in which the spaces were used uh, work using uh, pieces from the collection of Pompidou and some um, site specific and uh, um, commissioned, directly commissioned work as a way of testing the ground, testing the context, trying things out. The building was open for 24 hours over a weekend period. Um, the heat, natural ventilation and the heating and cooling of the building was, was studied. Um, what if we left it as it was? What would it, how would it work? Indeed, visitors were given blankets on cold days and um, bottles of water on hot days. It was uh, intended from the beginning to defy the convention uh, in which reuse and touching lightly was fundamental, not just a nice thing to have, but, was, but, but steered the whole project. That feels like it fits within a culture of museum making, which is always in flux and moving forward and not trying to reinvent Tate Modern, the Pompidou, Sesc Pompeii, projects that were all important references, but were in themselves steps along the way. And this canal project is finding its own step, its own set of relevances to its immediate society and ultimately a, a global cultural society. This is a view of the building as it stands now, uh, already active, in use, iconic in the least iconic type of way, uh, signs of many layers of, of, uh, of its life from, as I said, the original car factory into many other things during the war, after the war, left as a ruin for part. But a building that has a very, has a strong physicality. It has a power through its immense size and in some cases its extraordinary delicacy. And that delicacy, that reuse space becomes the setting for 
another period of its life. In this case, a public cultural space. When we visited the building in the initial stages, the, the physicality of the project was so extraordinary to all of us. Um, and in particular, I found at a personal level that the, the scale of the space in relation to the elements that made it were, seemed extraordinary to me. That this is a, a building that was by the way, not so much prefabricated, but fabricated extremely quickly in elements on the ground, made upon the ground and lifted into place. That the main structure of this garage was built uh, unbelievably quickly. I can't even tell you how quickly, because I was given the information, I didn't believe it, it was too fast. But you know, within weeks, this building was supposedly made. But when you look at it carefully, you see that it's composed of hand scale pieces almost. Some things have to be, you couldn't lift, but many elements of this building you could hold in your hands. And yet put together, bolted together, it made this two football pitch size space that was so strong that the structure becomes a kind of cloud, like a filigree landscape, piece of topography, um, light filtering through in different ways that create itself, it creates a, a very powerful setting, a setting just to be, a setting in which you could be lost, a setting in which an artist would need to react to, or a curator would need to um, find a kind of narrative work either reacting against or reacting with with the space and the other powerful aspect was the patina on the building and i think when we think of reuse um particularly more recently with this uh, and i don't mean this in a disparaging way but a kind of obsession with uh rough raw, wrought surfaces um that I'm equally fascinated with. That patina um, is the most vulnerable layer within the reuse, as we've discovered, because as we set out to touch the building incredibly lightly, we also had to provide the setting for a 21st century museum gallery in which uh, the best artwork in the world could be moved into this setting and um, safely exhibited which meant that, of course, the building has to perform, or at least in part, it has to perform to the highest environmental codes. And we, we got around that prob problem in a way by the strategy of the, of the competition, which was to insert three new volumes into this building, rather like the Mosque of Cordoba, that a, a structure can be added into an existing structure and they could live in a symbiotic way. And those new structures were, are highly uh, environmentally controlled, such that much of the building is left almost as you find it, but there are parts which are new and there are parts therefore which can perform in ways that are required for such a building. But as we started the process of um, investigation of survey in which we drew almost every element of this building um, from its surfaces on the ground to its painted elements. We discovered that there is a toxic layer, you know, the, the lead paint. Um, that was used over the years would now be in an unacceptable finish in a, a public environment. And it's that paint and that overpainting that you can see here, for example, there are no tape lines, nothing's been done precisely. It's been done as needs must to identify a route within the garage setting, for example, or to identify a hazard. Um, that this, this layer, all had to be removed or has to be removed in order to for the building to conform to health and safety and 
there was a great amount of mourning from our side for some time when we recognized that that what felt to us a very important part of the idea of reuse of, of the, the setting as found has, has to be transformed to give it the use that, it's intend, that is intended um, seems in some ways like a compromise. But of course it isn't, it's, an oppor it's another opportunity that buildings and their pattern are develop over time and that our current strategy, which is to remove where we have to paint and indeed add fireproofing paint in ways is being developed within a, an artistic strategy with a manual, a handbook that the painters will be uh, working with to ensure that there is a, a similarly sort of spontaneous approach to the repainting of the building, adding quietly but surely another layer, another pattern uh, to, the, to the building. So I raise it because within the reuse argument, it's quite easy, I think, to have a kind of romantic notion of what you find in front of you when you walk into a ruin or you walk into, as we did in the, 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 the garage, a sort of a building that feels like people have just left it. You know, you find yourself alone in a building that had almost the echo of a life going on. That there is the need to be very pragmatic also um, in approaching the reuse and the transformation of buildings. That doesn't affect the sustainable argument, which is really about the reduction of energy as much as possible. But I find, I find it so interesting that there's such an emotional charge to reuse. And I'm, I'm hoping that that will be a subject of the debate in, in the discussion. Because it strikes me that within the um, new, let's say, uh, the, the revitalized and newly focused direction towards the circular, circular economies, uh, reuse, reducing waste, etc. That world is a very technical world. And when you speak to the proponents and protagonists of, of, that, um, of that discipline, there's nothing romantic in their minds about the, the progress of how to build in a, in a, in a holistic but also in a sustainable way but I think as architects we inevitably add this layer of romance and probably nostalgia to the debate and effectively we make it more complicated for ourselves but it doesn't mean it's not useful and valuable to be romantic about the ruin. I think the the Noyce Museum which I'm no doubt will be uh, discussed at, today yeah, or in this debate is in some ways a good example that when you walk through the gallery spaces of the Neuss Museum in Berlin or indeed when you walk through or walk alongside the Pinakothek in Munich of Dolgast built and finished by the way, by the way before the Venice Charter was established you can't help feel an emotional reaction to the work, to the space, to the, the narrative. There's a narrative that is emanating and, and live. And I think one of the deep challenges within reuse, as we are right in the middle of that challenge with Canal, is how to find that emotional charge when the technical and code technical performance and, and codification obsessed industry uh, is working effectively against, against that idea of touching as little as possible. So when you, make, when you think of a public client whose responsibility is to make a safe interior and effectively a comfortable interior, uh, and we're working in the garage, which is, um, far too big to be able to uh, 
introduce all that kind of performance across the whole space within a budget that we have 125 million euros still a big budget but not big enough um you you have to find a balance of how you where, where you spend the money and where's the comfort and where is where's not the comfort where is the direct relationship with what was there in the past and what is the relationship between the visitor and the new work so what is the what is the new work and I mentioned at the beginning the Venice Charter and this interest in a, a kind of clear delineation between the old, the nearly old, the nearly new, the very new. In Canal, we're seeking this more closely knit set of layers so that the new construction is both conceptually, at both, you know, at both strategy and detail, connected with an understanding of the existing building, how it was made, made of small pieces, made with an economy of means, you know, in a way it was never intended, the garages were never intended to be an architectural icon, but just a useful space, set of spaces that could fulfil the requirements of car repair and car manufacture. Um, how can we make these, this balance? And we're seeking that kind of soft, soft interface between the new and the old. And most importantly, a kind of openness, an emphasis that this is a place of production as much as it is of viewing art. So there are things that go on that echo the life of the building in the past. Um, the fact that the canal doesn't have a fixed uh, collection means that it's somehow free of the constraints of custodianship that other important cultural institutes have. Inviting the artist to be nomadic in the space, to work in all areas of the building, so not to be restricted in the way that they work. <clears throat> And in the, in the end, we see the building as a vast container, a container that we've made fit for purpose and that can always be and ne is necessarily much bigger than that not only the existing architecture, but the existing time and place that we're in now. That it can be, um, it can have spaces of natural light and artificial light, spaces which are refined and others which are raw. Some are enclosed and others are open to the flow of people and movement of, of, of visitors. A flexible plan and a whole combination of potential use. So I think just to con sort of in a way conclude, the, the museum at Canal is a, is an important step in challenge, is in a way in, in addressing the issues of reuse. The, in, within the title, this new thinking upon adapt, adaptation and renovation, I don't really think of it as new, but merely, merely part of a continuity of thought. Um, a recognition that there is great potential as much as limitation on the reuse of buildings, that it's an imperative that we demolish as little as possible and make use of the, let's call it the material bank, as would be described within a circular economy, that a building holds. That even if we don't you reuse something within the building, it's, it's possible to reuse it somewhere else or, elements that we introduce in the building, which are the new structures, are also uh, comprise elements that could allow them to be dismantled and um, repurposed. This is a different way of thinking, a way that 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, the idea of demolishing a building was a quite a straightforward uh, sort of feasibility study. And indeed, the construction industry is still equipped only with this idea of removing as quickly as possible to create a tabula rasa in which something new can be made. 
and the industry has to change. And in certainly in Belgium, there is significant change afoot in this, this regard, that the old days of carefully dismantling things and stocking for use elsewhere is a growing tendency. And so with reuse comes the need to learn again, not to find new ways actually, but almost always to be reminded of the older ways of building, the older ways of making things useful again. And I find that the, the most challenging and interesting um, aspect of this subject of reuse. Sorry, we seem to have lost sound uh, with uh, with Chris. We've got full visuals, but um, whilst we try to just get the the sound back on, Stephen, it's um, it's been a, a fascinating presentation. Let's talk about Canal for a moment. Um, uh, how did you actually begin the connectivity with the the community um, to engage with them on that project? The project was. Uh, you know, already well known locally because it had been the building was was new and had been empty for some time, and there was a lot of talk about its potential development. So by the time we arrived at the competition stage, the client was uh, formed, the group was formed, and outreach programs had been established with local stakeholders, uh, local communities, local art institutions. Uh, as a way of you know, opening the debate, you could say. There was also a resident group because within the, it's a, it's a kind of complete urban block if you include the Kai Theatre, but there is one other building, which is an apartment building inside the block. Which, by the way, funny story that when uh, Citroën, Citroën bought the site, he wanted to buy the whole block. And uh, the story goes that he couldn't buy the... Um, this apartment building, and the owner refused to sell it. it turned out the owner was Michelin, <laughs> who uh, owned the. Anyway, so, so it, it remains outside the, the 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 project. But they were uh, long leasehold residents, and so we we met with them very early on. Actually, uh, we moved our office into the building in the, for the first nine months of the project. Um, that meant we were next door to those residents, for example, so we invited them into the studio. In fact, the studio became a kind of uh, an open forum for people to visit, and it was associated with a, an exhibition where we showed sort of ongoing work that was open to the public. But the, um, you know, unlike this country, where there's a sort of consultation process and you even have special people who offer the service. Um, this was much more informal. Uh, instead of, I felt, local voices, it was about the newspapers and television studios that wanted to talk about the situation. So they had a, a much kind of bigger heft, in a way, to the whole sort of uh, aura and issue about the relevance and the appropriateness of, of converting the building. And so it was much, it was so different to what we might, what we are used to in this country in residential projects, talking to local communities and having kind of workshops in that sort of rather intimate way. This was a, a much bigger, um, a bigger scenario. Stephen, I think we can bring Chris back in now. We've got connectivity. I think we've got sound and vision. So, uh, Chris. Okay. Go back to the Venice Charter. Chris. <coughs> Steve, yes. <clears throat> I, uh, I was, well, you obviously caught the first part of that. Sorry, yeah, you lost all of it. <laughs> I, you, got, oh, you got all of it. Well, yeah. I, I, in case anybody else didn't, I was essentially saying that over um, over you know, a, a long period of time, people were operating according to various quite kind of um, closely argued uh, views and strongly held beliefs about the appropriate way to deal with existing buildings. Going back to a kind of um, divergence of opinion, I guess, between Ruskin and Viola Le Duc. And it seemed to me from what you were saying, and I suppose what one could infer that we're in maybe a less prescriptive moment. And I wondered how you, what resources or what influences, what areas, what uh, theory you look to, to kind of shape your own attitude. I mean, as well as responding to the building, is there sort of any other inputs that, uh, that have shaped the way that you think about these things? Absolutely. Yeah, nice question. Um, 
I mean, I always enjoy understanding the origin of things. And I think when one approaches a subject like reuse, actively involved making a project, it is important to understand how what reuse means you know, from the beginning. And that's why to understand the Venice Charter was important to us. And it, you're absolutely right that it was a culmination of uh, a rather rigid set of ideas, but it was quite interesting to us that only up till recently those ideas remain have remained relevant. You know, the juxtaposition of new against old, you know, I find it pretty irrelevant. But it, if you if you meet planners or you uh, read ar uh, his architectural historians and critiquing buildings, it's fascinating how often they feel that's necessary to place one against the other. So, but I think the world has really changed. And I guess I'm, from my own education in the mid eighties, uh, I was educated during the period of postmodernism, uh, a reflection on and a deep criticism of modern. I hope Stephen will be rejoining us in a second, but I, I wonder if I can pick up on a couple of things that, um, that were perhaps common to, um, uh, to a lot of the conversations. One was about, um, the subject of uh, patina, which is you know one of the things that we all sort of find very attractive about existing buildings. And uh, I mean, Sarah, in the drone shots that you showed of your project, those that that building looked kind of in quite an extraordinary state. And I suppose there's a uh, the first question is how do you how do you begin to discern or by or by what um, judgment do you decide between what is dirt to be cleaned up and patina to be preserved? So in your case, for instance, um, I think the uh, the spray paint uh, graffiti that's within the building might be something you're keen to preserve now, but might not have been something you would have thought to preserve perhaps not very long ago. That would have been part of the cleanup operation. So uh, do you have a um, uh, do you have a kind of a, a yardstick by which you approach these things? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a really interesting building. I think that kind of, because um, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a conflict effectively between wanting to save pieces of artwork like the the one which I showed you in that photograph and also the necessity of insulating the building to create the kind of benefits that we can get through an increased um, performance in the thermal envelope. So um, it's quite it's kind of a sad thing that, that that particular picture probably will be lost. However, there are quite a number of elements of, of artwork within the building that we're trying to save so there's a really large um kind of uh, there's a lot of street art at the alley level and um, a huge door that we're salvaging and will be reused as part of the kind of the fit out if you like of the future building but i think given the state of disrepair and decay in there it's it's sad but quite a lot of that existing artwork will go so um part of it is kind of trying to respect there being a future pattern to the building. So for instance, commissioning artists to create murals through the project and through the construction that will kind of bring that art back into the building again. So we already have um, an artist who's working on a mural for us, hopefully for the staircases, that's of the um, drawings of the building as it is at the moment. So, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to keep some of those elements, but also kind of um, add to them as we work through the projects. Yeah, could I add to that actually, uh, Chris, that um, on the Cornish Cottage project that I showed, um, well, sometimes maybe it's okay to tell like little lies with the kind of way you do insulation, because there we actually sprayed on insulation to all the internal walls and then sculpted them to look like the original stone walls. So, and then polished plastered over them. So, you know, it's, they are kind of facsimile, but maybe, you know, 100 mil deeper into the building it's a, it's it's that okay to do I, d I know playing games with what's new and what's old it's a quite an interesting idea i suppose there's a difference between buildings that are um of interest between their because they are old uh, and have acquired that layer over time and buildings that are you know, judged to be historically significant and then you have that kind of obsessional recording of detail as david chipfield did at at the norris museum um and so i suppose in a more general sense because patina is is what's enjoyed about these things there is the the question of whether whether there, there is a sort of natural tendency which must be resisted to become too obsessional about it Stephen, you describe uh, patina as the most vulnerable layer 
uh, but seemed to take, a, a, and, and you know, it, it's lost to be regretted, but took a fairly pragmatic view uh, of, um, of the, uh, of, you know, accepting its loss and, and thinking about ways to uh, compensate for that. Yeah, well, I mean, it really wasn't our intention. We, the, the idea was to leave everything, the roof structure, just to brush it. Um, but because they found Chrome 6 in the paint um, and because we needed to fireproof up to a certain level anyway, slowly but surely it dawned on us that we were never going to achieve what we'd all hoped, including the client. Um, the client couldn't take responsibility for a building that had Chrome 6 within its surfaces, you know, as a, such a public project. But then, as I said in my presentation, I think that there is this pragmatism that reuse brings with it, which has uh, does confront us as architects. But I think you know we can take it on as a another creative project. And bit by bit, we found a way, or we're finding a way, of uh, of comfortably removing the pattern, you know, allowing for something new, knowing that the building will reset, you know, that other future patterns will take place, and. And how you might facilitate that extra layer is becomes the kind of project, you know, rather than nostalgia of what used to be, but what could be. Yeah. Another thing that I mean, it's, uh, I suppose. Uh, well, perhaps we can perhaps we can turn to it in a minute. But I mean, it, it, another thing that you mentioned, um, uh, which perhaps everybody could pick up on, was being struck by the physicality of the building. And I wondered whether you all found in in the projects that you've described that one of the pleasures of them is the opportunity to work with construction materials and types or methods that aren't necessarily commonly available now if you were to if you were to be working in new build that it's a kind of um uh yeah it's a, it's a rare opportunity to do that so as well as as well as having to deal with asbestos and chrome 6 you also get to deal with um uh, extraordinary um remnants of earlier times absolutely yeah, i mean for sure <laughs> in our case walking into a building you, you can't imagine you wouldn't build a building of this size anymore I mean, you wouldn't. It wouldn't happen. So, I'm sure it feels the same in Hastings as well. That, that it's just it's pure physicality. You can't build like that. So, it becomes incredibly precious as an experience. And you, I mean, I find it an absolute honour to work on a project like this. You know, to me, it's the dream of an architect because you can't build such things now. And so, how can you, how can you give them new life? You know, um, and it's really about the building and less about the sort of, you know. Yeah. Sarah, I guess if uh, if you weren't dealing with an existing building, it'd be unlikely that you would start off with caves as a foundation. Um. <laughs> Yeah, quite. Um, I mean, it's incredible. The building was built in 1924 and their first move was to dig this massive hole into rock face. Um, the caves at the bottom, we think, were originally smugglers' coves that were carved into the cliffs um, and then lined subsequently at, at an unknown stage in the building's history. And one of the beautiful things about this building is just its changing character. I mean, at the bottom of the building, the ceilings are kind of 4.75 meters high and there's these beautiful pieces of machinery that one assumes how they used to roll the newspapers along and kind of transport these big pieces of paper so we painstakingly grip blasted these brick vaults that so they, they, they line the limestone with brick um, but even on the floor there's the most wonderful kind of metal pattern tiles that we're keeping so look like we're not actually going to be insulating the bottom level to retain this industrial nature we have a very different use class in there but there's just something that's so magnificent about walking into that space it feels like a a concert hall except it's not it's an industrial space for printing newspapers and and that's magic it's uh, uh, yes yeah, um i'd kind of reiterate this idea of it being an honor to work on buildings like that it's Rob, almost you, like collaborating with an architect you'll never get to meet well, that's, you, you said something along the lines i think in in your talk earlier about um yeah you know, to words to the effect that you know architects are always responding to a site and a program you know that's the sort of germ of an idea but here you're responding to a building and is it possible that because architects have a particular interest in an affinity for buildings that response is particularly strong when when the site is a building that um that you know you bring a, a huge amount of your knowledge and uh, and and outside interest to it yeah um Stephen mentioned in his talk the alta pinatech in munich and i think that's a really useful project that kind of links Sarah and Stephen's 
talks because of the idea of um, you know it was a bomb damage to a museum cultural building and then through the Truman Frau, the, the women who collected the bricks from Munich, that was how it was rebuilt. So the kind of idea of community engagement in Sarah's talk, and I think that's a really interesting link there. And also the idea of pattern and the Dolgast had the bricks kind of painted or some kind of texture put on them that homogenized them and created this kind of new, interesting new layer of patina, um, but looked old. It's very interesting kind of building that one. Can I just add something? I think it connects to the conversation about material bank you know, because, with, as you say, in Munich, the, the bricks were reclaimed from demolished adjacent buildings. Most of them don't, didn't come from the, the Cleanser original museum. And so they were collected together by the women, the Munich women, and, and, and built, used again to make this new wall. So the, the brick, the material itself had a hugely symbolic um, weight to it but at the same time it represents this really interesting um, kind of revitalized idea about a building being a bank of material it's yeah. something that we're addressing in brussels because the brussels region have really taken on this circle economy seriously and i find that a very new way of thinking as an architect to to realize that you know you Usually you think you find something in the building and you carefully want to keep it and enjoy it and you think it's attached to the building. Or even you might specify something for a project and it's in your mind attached to that project. And I think there is a shift to think now that we have material and we put it together, but we could actually take it away and move it. And that there's this shift of, and movement of material, which is in order to, finally to sort of support this idea of low energy, you know, to to reclaim, reuse, and reapportion. I, I find that a really fascinating thing. And there, Dolgas was doing it, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's, the some, <laughs> there's some really interesting companies in Belgium, aren't there? There's a uh, Rotor DC, right. I think, yeah. and and then also there's BC Architects, I think, do urban mining, where you yeah. actually take the material from the site and make bricks off the yeah. site. So hyper contextual yeah, material yeah. making. We're working with Rotor at the moment because near their, their warehouse, we're making a quite a large project for, which is called CityGate, and there are a number of buildings. And there we're proposing to dismantle one of the existing buildings on the site and reuse the brick um, on one of our buildings. The interesting thing, though, is that, again, you come across this codification issue that you can't, you can't take a good facing brick from a building from the 30s and stick it on your building and say that's fine because you can't get building rigs. You know, it doesn't achieve it because of the frost uh, and uh, loading factors which have all changed to make it the, the fact that brick can't technically work. So it's really interesting that this direct transfer is now complicated by lots of other things. So in our case, for example, we're thinking of maybe combining it into a slip system for example or use the bricks inside the building where there isn't the same frost and loading issues i, mean, so I think it it uh i think stephen in your presentation you you sort of hinted at uh, the idea of, of design for careful disassembly uh, yeah. being something that kind of alludes back to a very early way of, uh, of thinking about construction when materials were very valuable but also it, it uh ties in with the current way of thinking about cradle to cradle and so on and keeping exactly. very high-tech digital databases of, of materials and so on and materials as a, uh, buildings as a, as a value store. So I just wondered whether the experience of working on existing buildings and thinking about construction in that way uh, also helps to shape your work in not, not outside reuse, in new build uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know whether, whether, whether reuse might start to kind of inform um, the way that we build other buildings. I think not necessarily reuse, but the reality that an economy based on consumption, which relies on an inexhaustible uh, hoard of raw material, you know, the linear model that we've all been brought up with to extract, to make, you know, to use and then to throw away. It, it's just over. It's not sustainable. You can't live like that. So whether it's reusing a building or making a new building, we have to design now with a different mentality, which is that it isn't a linear model. It has to work in the round. And that that affects everything, both reuse and new build. 
And so, Sarah, you your practice does a lot of work in um, uh, in new build as well as as well as reuse. And but you you, you sort of started the practice at at a moment where there's been a focus on reuse of buildings um, uh, in a way that perhaps what didn't exist in, in previous times. Does does that um, does that consciousness of buildings as being something that will in future be recycled and reused and repurposed much more as a default uh, affect the way that you think about building in general? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot. I mean, we actually work not just on new builds, but also on, on meanwhile projects, which I think are like very kind of influenced by the work that we do in terms of retrofitting. So we find it very interesting to take buildings that just have a moment in time left. So pre-development, what can you actually use these spaces for? So rather than knocking down a building and waiting for the big developer to come and put their mark on the side, um, we're Working with companies like Meanwhile Space to kind of um, facilitate a better use of those. And it developed to such an extent that we ended up working on a project with Southwark Council, which actually looks to use a site for an interim period of 10 years and actually create a fully demountable building that can then actually be moved from site to site across Southwark to create community facilities. And this is all kind of like um, playing off these ideas of kind of really using sites in a very kind of efficient way. Um, and respecting the fact that we mustn't just use, like have these empty areas of our cities which aren't being used for kind of community and social good. Yeah. And Rob, I think you concluded your presentation by saying that maybe within within the attitudes uh, uh, and practices of reuse, there is a kind of germ of a new way for thinking about buildings in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, almost conditioning your building to be adapted mm -hmm. later by someone else. You know, yeah. I think it's. Um, yeah, almost like you're designing the plinth for someone else's statue. I think it's a nice uh, way of thinking. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, maybe that's a nice way of thinking about it. Um, in terms of just going back to materials and, you know, having materials in buildings that are reusable, I mean, the way we look at it now is just on a really basic level of natural type materials. You know, um, it seems very refined chemically or like man made materials aren't. So good at that and we see that with plastics now so insulation made from wood and wool rather than pir it's kind of a very basic way we can make it easier yeah and i i'm i'm conscious of the fact that we're we've overrun the time and i've let it run on a little bit because of our technical hitches before for which again uh, apologies but we do have to draw to a close so i wonder if i could just ask you each um in turn whether um uh, there are any things either that um, things that are currently um, impediments to better reusing buildings and some of the things perhaps that have come up are along the lines of um, uh, the expectations of a certain level of comfort, which means having to um, having to change buildings in ways that don't necessarily add to their um, experience, experiential value, even if they add to their um, thermal performance. Um, so are there any other things that that you know you think would be would allow us to better uh uh better reuse and, and enjoy reused buildings and also just more generally apart from sustainability uh which is obviously a big driver of uh, of the way that we currently think about buildings are there any other things in the culture at the moment which are um uh, which which contribute towards uh, there being a, a sort of more of an interest in um uh, less of an interest in stand out of their time landmark uh, monumental buildings and more of this kind of more collaborative dialogue with as you say architects of the past um and uh, uh a slightly more kind of um a cooperative way of building i don't know who, who would like um, it's, it's almost like you want to um list everything but make list of building consent a lot easier <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of um so if we say what we have now is what's there don't knock it down improve it or change it and then make it easy for people to do that and also there's the vat thing but we won't go into that now yeah. so, huge yeah sarah i don't know if you want to pick up on either of those things either anything that makes list uh, reuse buildings uh, easier or more enjoyable or, or anything that you think might be feeding into what does seem to be a, a, a uh a, a more widespread interest among architects in in the creative and other uh, opportunities to be found within existing buildings. Um, I think 
I think it's really exciting working with existing buildings because I think quite a lot of the time communities find it easier to imagine what the space might be like because they, they may have been in it, they may have walked past it. So the, the opportunity is that you're not trying to sell an entirely new vision. You're trying to kind of invite people to imagine a new future for something that they already have a fondness for and understanding of. Um, and that's a really great thing because I, I also feel like people have more confidence in giving their opinion. So actually the engagement side of developing retrofit projects is easier um, than we find but perhaps when we're doing new builds and people don't feel so confident about commenting on new build design whereas if you show them something that they've seen before they're like oh I don't like that window <laughs> and that's um and that's fun because you can have these great debates um I think the things that hold back um potential retrofit I mean of course like it's difficult quite often to get through planning but it is <laughs> with um a lot of different types of um builds I think it comes down to money and of finding the right clients. Um, for instance, with the Observer building, if um, if it hadn't been for this client, I really feel like that this building would never have ever been developed. And as I said at the beginning, there's been something like 13 planning applications and 34 years of dereliction, nobody doing a single repair. And that's because they couldn't make the numbers stack up. So trying to make um, big profits out of quite um, dilapidated buildings is really difficult. Um, so there's a real question about how we actually fund some of these projects and what importance and values placed on um, our environment as opposed to just like literally turning a profit to get kind of luxury flats in old buildings. And Stephen, you've described Canal as the project of an architectural lifetime, mm. but perhaps that wouldn't have been necessarily something someone would have typically thought, let's say 20, 20, 30 years ago, about A, a reuse project and B, a project done in conjunction with other other people, not as a kind of, um, uh, you know, your signature work, as it were, or with your signature all over it. Um, do, you do you think that is reflective of a wider change in attitude? I think so. And I, I, I think it just takes this pandemic to understand and, and almost formalise the huge cultural shift that the world is taking. And I, this idea of the collective is increasingly important. Um, across many layers I, I find it is an inclusive approach which 20 years ago you're right it wouldn't have been either interesting or even possible you know but there's a there's a greater kind of militancy um, evident you know within a city within communities which I think is a really powerful energy and uh, a kind of message to developers and architects to to work with that for, because it's going to be much more interesting and much the project is likely to be much more relevant for much longer than it is if it's a kind of quick design competition with a famous architect builds a project blah 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 and it's supposedly good for regeneration yeah i think it's much more complex now but those projects had to happen you know bilbao had to happen the tate modern had to happen and it these projects do transform and evolve, the debate evolves through those projects so i think everything's legitimate and the world is changing but these projects are stepping stones and in the end i find the point about in the invest the investment of the client is of course it's crucial because it is a lot easier to knock something down and build it very cheaply um but it's wholly irresponsible <laughs> to do that. so you know well, if you want to say no as an architect, you should. But, yeah, we all know practice is tough. Thank you I very much. We're, I'm sorry, just, that seems like a great place to leave it, although, of course, it's by no means the end. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a, 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 a statement of the position at the moment. It's a debate that will carry on. It's a shame that we didn't get to um, uh, cover many of the things that, uh, that came up. I mean, even just, uh, Sarah, in your last comment about the advantage of having a building well known to a local community, I wondered whether we might talk about circumstances in which that's a disadvantage uh, <laughs> and in which, you know, people's very strong feelings about the buildings they have might be uh, an impediment to, um, uh, uh, to imagining a, a, a certain kinds of reuse. But it will be, uh, I'm afraid, something that we have to return to uh, on another occasion. Thank you very much uh, to our three speakers again for your 
uh, very interesting and stimulating presentations and for your conversation afterwards. Um, thank you very much to our event partner, Shuko, uh, for uh, the collaboration on this uh, on this event and this program. And I uh, hope to see uh, you, the audience, uh, at the next one. In the meantime, thank you very much to you. So thank you.